Hey, good evening, everybody. Um, I just feel by the Lord's mercy we are here. Um, rain or shine? Rain or shine. We are here by the Lord's mercy. Okay. I still feel that one of you needs to lead us in prayer for this time. And maybe Isaac, can you please? Amen. Yeah, can you stand up, Isaac? Yeah. Amen, Lord. We give you this time. Mm-hmm. Lord, we turn our hearts to you. Yes. Lord, capture us more right now. Amen. Lord, we want to see you as the new creation. Yes. Lord, we want to enter into this experience. Yes. Oh, Lord, we need you. Yes. Lord, we love you. That's why. That's why. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Isaac. So, um, as you know, we have been marching our way through the book of 2 Corinthians. And tonight... Although it's not necessarily a metaphor, we come to a very um, unique topic, um, not only in 2 Corinthians, but in the entire Bible. And that is uh, an expression that Paul uses in this book, as well as in the book of Galatians, and that is a new creation. So that is the topic for tonight, and we can see this in the following verse. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. How about we all read that verse together? Go. So then, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, they have become new. So, as you can see, the emphasis here is on the new creation. And I, I encourage you to remember that verse, even to memorize that verse. Um, so, First of all, I would like to, in a very rough way, to share with you the contrast between the Old Testament and the New Testament in the Bible. Okay? The Old Testament, we can say in very broad terms, is the history of God with us. Okay? That's the Old Testament. He is there, but he is outside. God never mingled with or got inside of his creation. So it's the story of God with us. But in contrast to that, we have the New Testament. And that is an amazing change. It's like a wonder of wonders. It's the history of God not only with us, but God in us us. God in us. Now, to go from God with us to God in us, it took several steps. You know what happened in between? To go from one to the other? I'm going to show you something that, you know, you are very familiar with. (laughs) That's what happened. That's how, you, that's how God went from with us to in us. And instead of me telling you these steps that God had to take to come from this side to this side, I'm going to ask for a volunteer to tell us in two minutes or so this process. Are you familiar with this uh, bracelet? Yes? Okay, I need a volunteer. Two minutes. You can uh, stand up and speak to everybody. Walk us through this. Okay, who? Okay, Jason. Go ahead, yes. Okay, God became a man. He lived a perfect life. Okay, Jason, maybe you, could, you, ha- you should have this. This is the pointer, the red, the red dot, the red dot. Okay, and come, come up, come up, come up, come up, come up. Yeah, yes. God became a man. Yeah. Yes. He lived the perfect life. Right. Yeah. He died on the cross. So yeah. He, uh, okay, he was well, crucifixed and then he died, right? Yeah, he went down. He, uh, he arose. Um, I'm sorry, I'm choking right now. <laughs> <laughs> he went down. He arose from the dead. Hallelujah. Yes. And then he ascended. Yeah. And he ascended to the throne of God. Uh huh. And at the throne of God, he descended yes. into the human spirit. Amen. And when he descended into the human spirit, he now lives inside of all of us. Amen. Okay, very good. How about we give him a hand? That's good. 
What about a, a sister? Can a sister do it? You don't have to come up front. You can be wherever you are sitting. Oh, Eleanor, okay. Uh, you want to? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, Eleanor. Okay. Okay, Eleanor, very good. Hello. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, this is the pointer. Mm -hmm. You can come here. This way, this way, this way. Yeah. Wow, this is the whole process. Okay. Yes, and this is the red, okay, to point. Okay. okay. I'm standing with you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Man. Yes. In the beginning of the Gospel of John, it says, "In the beginning was the Word." Whoa! Wow. Woo! Woo! And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Yes. And then in verse fourteen, it says, "Whoa! Wow. Wow. Jason." and tabernacled so shows God becoming a man yeah and he lived a perfect human life yes and then he died on the cross to yeah. redeem us yes and just to save us from this world and then he was um, buried yes and after the third day he rose uh -huh. and resurrected yes and then and so we now he's uh he is ascended and sits on the throne yeah and then um oh lord but now he is living in us as the spirit yes and so now we can now we can live christ amen so awesome okay <laughs> They did a very uh, much better job than I could have done. And one thing, in resurrection, what happened to him? Because here you have the two becomings, right? Right here, the first one, he became flesh. But here, what happened? He became what? He was designated as the Son of God. Romans 1, 4. Amen, brother. And, and then, very good, and then in resurrection, he became something. Okay, all together. He became? The life-giving spirit. Very good. Okay, and as such a one, now he can dwell inside of us. Okay, very good job. Now, so you, are you clear? Yes. To go from just, from with us to in us, he had to go through a process. And now, in the previous slide, you saw the, you know, he comes here. But what part of us? And both of them mention it. So these are the three parts of men. Now I need a freshman to tell me what these three parts are. I need a freshman. Who? Go ahead. Uh, uh, okay, go ahead. Okay, so the first one is? No, they go from the, the, the center. Yeah, the inside. Yes, right there. Good. Then the soul. Then the body. Okay. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay, now, 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 now. What is the verse? That shows us the three parts. What's the verse that tells us these three parts in one verse? Okay, uh, Jackson, do you remember? No, okay. Uh, another, somebody else. What's the verse that speaks about the spirit, soul, and body? Lane, do you know? Is it 1 Thessalonians 5.23? Oh, very good. Very good, very good, very good. Okay. Okay, we're, we're doing well, okay? <laughs> now, we said in resurrection, Christ became the life-giving spirit. Very good. So, he comes to dwell where? In our human spirit, right there. Okay? So, he's, he has come to dwell inside of us as the life-giving spirit. A few verses that help us is, for instance, John 3, 6. Isaac, can you quote that verse? John 3, 6. Wait. That which is born. Okay, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Very good. You see, that which is born of the spirit, capital S, spirit, is the small s, spirit. In that one verse, John 3, 6, you have two spirits. One is with capital S, and the other with small s. That which is born of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the life-giving Spirit, is our human spirit. Okay, now, 
When that happened, the two spirits became mingled into one. So, there is one verse that says that he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. A freshman, can you give me the reference? He who is, that, that's the verse. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So, what's the verse? Zebian, do you know? Okay, a uh, sophomore. Okay, very good, very good. First Corinthians 6, 17. Very good. Okay, so that's the process uh, he went through. Okay. Therefore, well, but that's not all, okay? So Christ is inside of us now. And when that happened, when he, as the life-giving spirit, came into us, we became a new creation. God had already a creation. God spoke and things came into being. But these things, not having the life of God, nor the nature of God, became old. That applies to us. That applies to me. That applies to my marriage. That applies to your studies. Whenever God is not there, that thing, whatever it is, becomes old. You want anything you do or touch to stay young and even newer, you need to allow God to come into that. So when God came into us, we became a new creation. Okay? But look at that. He's just in our spirit. It's just the beginning. Now he needs to spread into our soul. And that's why we have that verse in Ephesians 5, uh, 4.23. And that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That phrase, the spirit of your mind, means that the Lord as the spirit wants and he needs to spread from within you into your soul. The leading part of your soul is the mind. So when that verse says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, it really means this process of growing, spreading. He wants, God needs, he wants to spread from our spirit into our soul. So even though we became a new creation at the time of our re regeneration, God's work of Gaining us has not been completed. He needs our cooperation so that he, you, we, you and I will be renewed day by day. Even though our outward man is decaying, yet our inward man is being renewed day by day. Okay? So that's um, number one. That's the definition, which I feel we need to read. If you go to your outline... On number one, the definition, there are four bullets that summarize what I just shared. Maybe brothers read bullet one and sisters two and we alternate. Go ahead. In its fundamental meaning, the new creation is man mingled with the triune God. The power of man... Go ahead. Very good. Brothers. Okay, so that's, that's number one, and we use these slides to, you know, cover this very crucial point. I hope you are clear as to what is the new creation. It's really God, the triune God, who through such a marvelous process, as Isaac and Eleanor described, has come to dwell inside of us, to mingle with us. And now, it is in the, he is in the business of growing and spreading into our soul, into our mind, our emotion, and our will. Okay, so day by day, the experience of a normal Christian is that we are being renewed. Okay? Ultimately, 
you know, the end of the Bible concludes with something called the New Jerusalem. That's the consummation of all of God's work in renewing us day by day. Then we have number two. How about we read that number together? Go. Okay, so for this point, I consider these two verses, and um, I'm just going to dwell a, a couple of minutes here because I have a, f- a much more feeling for the next few points. But here we have Galatians 2.20. How about you go ahead and read that verse together? Go. Very good. So here, uh, mainly I just want to emphasize a few points, and I want you to underline the two I's, the no longer I who live, that's the first I, and the second one I want you to underline or highlight is the second I, and the life which I now live. There are two I's there. No longer I who live, and the life which I now live. Every genuine believer has two statuses. The first I is the all man, the all creation. And that one has been crucified. Okay? The second I, the one that says I now live, is the new man, the new creation. Okay, so you have to be clear about these two points. And it is God's intention and his economy that the first eye will be crucified with Christ. It will be terminated. And it is God's intention that this new eye will be Christ living in us for the expression of God through us in Christ. Okay, so... We have to really exercise, okay? Although Christ has come to dwell in us for the renewing of our mind, we really have to exercise to deny the old man and to turn to God as the spirit within us so that we can live in the reality of the new creation, okay? This first I, the old creation, has a tendency The tendency to keep the law. The tendency to improve himself. The tendency to improve his behavior. That's the old eye. And God is not pleased with that. That is not his intention. He wants that eye to be terminated. Instead of that, God's intention with the new eye is that we will live Christ. So that God will be expressed through us. Okay? Then the second verse, Galatians 5.25, how about you go ahead and read it together. Go. If we live. Okay. So here this verse says, if we live by the Spirit. It doesn't say if we live by the law. Okay. Or try to keep the law. Or try to be better. It says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. This walk is a very particular walk. It's a walk that takes God's goal as the direction and purpose of your life. That's the kind of walk. And we experience the reality of the new creation when we walk according to the Spirit. We, be, we become dependent on the Spirit for our daily walk And we take the Spirit's direction as the principle for our lives. Okay? Now, this doesn't happen just spontaneously. We do not default into the Spirit. And our daily walk does not default into this kind of walk by the Spirit mentioned by Paul in Galatians 5. We really need to exercise. Okay? To have a turn to the Lord by calling on His name. Right? By pray, reading his word. We need a supply that will strengthen us. And that's why the next point in your outline, 
I felt it would be very good to touch the supply needed for our daily walk. If we're going to live in the reality of the new creation, if we're going to have the old eye to be crucified and live according to the new eye, or if we are going to walk by the Spirit, we need the supply. And that's why we have these verses, John 6, 57. I know those of you who were in the college conference will hit this verse very strongly, right? We don't want to focus on first living Christ. We want to focus on eating Christ. If we eat Christ, we will walk by the Spirit. If we eat Christ, we will leave Christ. If we eat Christ, we will magnify Christ. So how about we read that verse, John 6, 57, go. As the living Father has sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also shall live because of me. He who eats me shall live because of me. This is, this is the, the crucial point, brothers and sisters, the vital point. If God can recover this point among us, he has a way through us. It's all a matter of eating. Man's problem before God is not a problem of behavior or conduct. Man's problem before God is a matter of diet. How, the, how man, be, first of all, fell. What was the beginning of man's fall? It was a problem of eating. He ate the wrong thing. And God, what is God's way of recovering man back to his purpose? He's eating. In Egypt, they ate the Passover lamb. When they crossed the Red Sea into the wilderness, they ate the manna for 40 years. When they got into the good land, they ate the produce of the land. In the gospel, John, I mean, the Lord Jesus in John says, I am the bread of life, he who eats me. It's always about the eating. And the conclusion of the Bible, in Revelation 22, verse 14, Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have right to the tree of life. Our destiny for eternity is eating Christ. God must recover our eating. We know about our eating. We have spoken to you about eating. We can give confidence about eating. But if we don't, in practice, in our daily life, if we don't recover this matter, God has no way. And the devil is so subtle. The devil can let you do good things for God. As long as you don't eat. So guess, if this is true, if what I'm sharing with you tonight is true, guess where all the army, the weapons of Satan will be directed, directed to you in your daily life? Yeah. Eating. He will bring a lot of things as long as you don't eat. He knows. You know, so many years ago, this brother was this size. Eight, ten pounds, I don't know how many. But look at me now. Yeah. <laughs> how it happened? How can I stand and speak and share? Only one way. Eating. Yeah. Satan knows this. So especially with young people, he will do whatever it takes. As long as you don't eat. He knows. He wins. If you don't eat, he wins. So I hope that this is not only a teaching both in the conference or here, but really, we pray, Lord, recover my eating. Yeah. Recover my hunger for you. Yeah. Don't let me go one day without eating you. And this is a secret that a brother in the 1800s, he learned, George Mueller, in the 1800s. He has an article entitled, First. How about we all read that quote? This is marvelous. Go ahead. That's the secret. He learned that. Listen to what he's saying. The first thing is not how to, how can I glorify God? 
How can I serve him? But how can I have my inner man nourished? That's the root of our day. Okay? Then we have number four. And this is my last point. Taking advantage of the circumstances arranged for us by God. Here is my heart for you. And I want to teach you to trade with God. Make business with God. And seize every available opportunity. I'm speaking not from a book. This was my experience. And here it has been the experience of many Christians throughout the ages. Okay? So, I'd like to begin with Romans 8.28. How about we all read that together? Go. A very well-known verse by many Christians. But sometimes it may be misapplied or misinterpreted. Okay, so here you have the verse. And we know that all things work together for good. For good. What is that good? In the context of these verses, if you go back and read your Bible, according to the context, the good here is not related to physical persons, matters, or things. It's not your grades. It's not your car. It's not your new device. Not even your health. The context here, it refers to our gaining more of Christ. That's why all things work together for good. And that good is for you and I to gain more Christ. To our having him wrought into our being. That we may be transformed metabolically and may eventually be conformed to his image. The image of, his, of the Son of God. I'm sure this point is so crucial. And that's why the interruption. <laughs> <laughs> this is the good. It's not a new house, a new car, a new device, whatever. It's that we may gain Christ. Amen. It's that God will spread from within us and make us more the new creation. Amen. Right? And then, you have Job 23.10. Go ahead and read that verse. Go. Should he try me? And you will be tried. Some brothers, a brother I know and you know, is having right now an organic chemistry test. He has been tried. And you are going to be tried next week or in finals. God is well able to deliver you from those trials, but he will not. Why? Why does God allow us to go through so many things? It's just like this diagram. You have Job 23.10, right? And that's the beginning. You start right here, and you end up right here. But look at what is in between. You have the trials. Trials. That's human life. We go through them. But then what? Well, for a Christian, there are only two ways you can come out of a trial. You can come either bitter or, like Job says, come forth as gold. That's, that, that's the two ways you can come out of a trial. Either bitter, why God? Why me? Why did you allow this? Or you can come forth as gold. And what is gold? Well, let the Bible interpret the Bible. Job 22, 25, right? Says, you have it right there. Go ahead and read it. 25a, go. Yes. That goal is God. So you need to come out of that trial with more God wrought into your being. That's why God allows you to go through that. And you need to aspire to that. You need to remind God about that verse. You need to tell him, Lord, if I'm not going to come out of, uh, you know, like gold out of these trials, if I'm not coming out of my college years as gold, then why are you allowing me to go through all these things? 
I resist the idea of not coming forth as gold. I must come forth as gold. You know, there will be a day, Ezekiel, you know, in that big auditorium, they will call Ezekiel Lozano, and then all your family and in the commencement ceremony, they will be there. And, <laughs> and Ezekiel is going to come, you know, like, <laughs> and either they shake your hand or give you a piece of paper. Let, let me tell you something, Ezekiel. I hope, brother, when the angels and God were, are watching, when you, do you are called? They see gold. Yeah. Then the angels even will stretch their necks to see the marvelous change of the new creation. That's how you, my brother and sister, you need to aspire to come out of your college years. And when that commencement ceremony comes, I hope God and the angels, when they watch you, they see gold. Because the Almighty will be your gold nuggets. Now, trade. You need to know God, and you know, need to know his heart, and how he's not tricking you, okay? So I'm trying to unveil to you tonight how you can trade with God. He will be very happy. Okay, so here you have the divine trade. Number one, 1 Peter 5, 7. Okay, let's read that together. Go. Casting all... I mean, what, 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 is, what is causing you anxiety? Okay, Isaac, I need a God. That you're God, you're God. Okay, okay. So, so I, I have all these, you know, these, all these anxieties. And, you know, there are two things that rob you from your joy. One is sin, that you know how to deal with it by the blood of Christ. And the other is anxiety. And then something comes your way. You know, that quiz or that midterm. Or that final, you know. And the more you keep them, the more your joy goes away. But that verse says, casting. That is not a soft word. It's a very strong word. Some, verse, some translations render it, throw. Throw completely. Casting all your anxieties. And then another one. Casting all your anxieties upon him because it matters to him concerning you. He cares for you. Now, is that all? Yeah, God wants you to be, hey, I'm anxiety free, no more anxieties. Is that all? Based upon what I'm sharing tonight, is that all? No, no, no. What God does in the next few verses, go ahead and read 6, 7, and 9, brothers, sisters, and all together. Go. Okay, no, no, maybe keep it here. Okay, you keep this. Yeah, give me this. Very good. Notice something there. The peace of God. Underline that. The peace of God, in verse 7, and in verse 9, the God of peace. Why am I putting this here? Because whenever the Bible says the love of God, the peace of God, the righteousness of God, it means that that peace, love, or righteousness is God himself. So, here is the, uh, the, the scene according to Philippians 4. You have all these anxieties, and I believe me, I practice this, all my years in the PhD here. Okay, so here's the anxieties, and there is God. I already told you in First Peter 5, 7, you need to trust this, cast all this in, to him. But Philippians 4 tells us practically how. So you make motion toward God by means of all prayers, right? Let your request be made known to God. That Greek word means making motion toward God. By prayer, by petition, you give these things to Him. These final to Him. 
And as I said, that's not the end. You know what he does? It says, and the peace of God, which surpasses every man's understanding, will guard your heart. That means God as peace has come into your heart. And he's patrolling your heart, keeping new anxieties away. So when you give him your anxieties, you know what he gives you? Himself as gold. <laughs> you see, that's the trade. That's the transaction. You give him your anxieties, and he gives you himself. Now imagine, Lane, how many quizzes you will have in college. How many midterms? How many finals? How many projects? How many papers? All these are opportunities for you to practice the divine trade. You give your anxieties, he gives you himself. And after four years of dozens and dozens of these transactions, you will come forth as gold. And when they call Lane, what is your last name, Lane? Morgan. Lane Morgan. And Lane Morgan. And God and the angels. Wow, look at the marvelous change of the new creation. Because you learn to trade with God. Okay, so thank you, my brother. Let me just finish here. Um, okay, so here you have Philippians 4, 6, 7, and that's the end. <laughs> okay. <laughs>